Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to the second part of our two-part series focusing on more tragic stories involving fast food workers. If you haven't seen part one, be sure to check that out first. We'll leave a link in the description below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. With that out of the way, here is part two of two more terrifying crimes targeting fast food workers. At around 11 p.m. on May 24, 2000, employees of the Main Street Wendy's in Flushing, Queens, prepared to close the restaurant for the evening. It began like any other weeknight, with the seven people on staff sweeping, cleaning up, and waving the last few customers away before they could lock the doors behind them and perform their final closing duties. The restaurant's 27-year-old manager, Gene August, was in his office in the building's basement. 18-year-old Jaquan Johnson had been manning the grill all shift and was now busy cleaning it up. 23-year-old Patrick Castro had just finished his fourth day on the job and was putting away any unused fresh ingredients back into the walk-in fridge for the next day. 44-year-old Ramon Nazario, 40-year-old Ali Ibadat, and 18-year-old Jeremy Melly were taking care of their own small tasks around the restaurant. And though her shift was technically over, 22-year-old cashier Anita Smith had decided to stay behind and give her co-workers a little extra help. However, at some point during their well-orchestrated routine, the six employees were interrupted by the sound of manager Gina Gust over the restaurant's intercom. He asked all of them to come down to his office for an important meeting. Though this seemed like a bizarre request, especially considering the late hour, the employees complied and headed downstairs. By the time anyone realized what was going on, it was too late. It turned out that there was no meeting at all. The fast food restaurant was actually being robbed. Once downstairs, the employees were greeted by two men. 36-year-old John Taylor and 30-year-old Craig Godino. Taylor was carrying a 38 caliber handgun. The man had shown up at the restaurant a little while earlier, and despite the proximity to closing time, had been allowed inside. This was because Taylor had formerly worked as the manager of the location and knew Gina Gust. Some of the other employees had also recognized him and didn't think twice when he appeared and asked to be let inside. He and Godino had seemed friendly with Jean, and their conversation attracted little attention from the other employees as they diligently finished their work for the evening. Once all of the employees were in the basement, Taylor and Godino duct taped their hands and mouths before forcing all of them to walk into the restaurant's cooler. It was a grim sign of the horrifying crime to come. No one outside of the restaurant would realize that anything was wrong until police received a frantic phone call just before 1 a.m. By that point, five of the seven employees would be dead, and the other two would be suffering from serious injuries. The terrifying crime would become one of the bloodiest and most chilling ever to take place at a fast food restaurant, and would come to be known as the Wendy's Massacre. When police arrived on the scene that morning, they were led into the restaurant by a terrified and wounded Patrick Castro. Though he had been shot through the side of the face, the bullet had missed any critical parts of his body, and he would be okay. Likewise, Jaquan Johnson had also survived, though his injuries were far more severe. He had been shot in the head, and would be partially paralyzed for months after the attack. Miraculously, he would go on to make almost a full physical recovery, later describing the feeling of the gunshot wound as being like hit in the face with a sledgehammer. The rest of Patrick and Jaquan's co-workers, though, were far less lucky. They were found still inside the restaurant's walk-in fridge, each with bullet wounds to the head. Not only had they been gagged and bound with duct tape, but their heads had been covered by plastic bags. They would all be pronounced dead shortly afterwards. It turned out that the suspects had been unable to get into the restaurant's main safe, where most of the money was kept. When all was said and done, they had only managed to get away with roughly $2,400. The situation only became more tragic as details were released about the five lives that had been so callously and prematurely ended. 
both Ramon Nazario and Ali Ibadat had left behind young families and were the fathers of two children. Ali had spent the last three years working all sorts of jobs in order to send money back to his wife and sons in Pakistan. At just 18 years old, Jeremy Melly, the youngest of the victims, had barely started his life. A member of the Navy Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps, he had been thinking about joining the military after school and had aspirations of becoming a car mechanic. Anita Smith was a vibrant and caring young woman who, in addition to working to save up for school, spent her free time working with autistic children. She had been hoping to attend college that coming fall and study to become a social worker. Jean Auguste, a Haitian immigrant who had earned his citizenship two years prior, was in love and had gotten engaged to his girlfriend just one month before his death. They had dreamed of moving to Florida and starting a family. Understandably, the case was extensively publicized almost immediately, leading to widespread fear amongst members of the public. Several workers at the Wendy's restaurant told the media that they refused to return to the location and that they would be looking for new jobs due to concerns about their safety. However, fear quickly turned to outrage when authorities revealed details about their two suspects. Thanks to fingerprint evidence left by John Taylor at the scene of the crime, and eyewitness accounts from Patrick, Jaquan, and other people who had been in the area of the restaurant at the time, police quickly knew who they were looking for. Within a day of the murders, they announced that they were searching for one of the restaurant's former employees, and soon, both Taylor and Godino's names were released in the media. While both men had criminal records, with Godino previously serving time for selling drugs and for robbery, it was Taylor's history that was particularly hard to ignore. Despite having a track record of serious crimes at fast food restaurants, he had somehow managed to avoid jail time. In 1996, he was arrested and charged with second-degree attempted robbery after a holdup at a Manhattan McDonald's. In that case, he agreed to plead guilty to burglary in exchange for a sentence of five years probation. In the middle of 1999, he was fired from his job at a different Wendy's in Queens after he was allegedly caught stealing from the safe, but it's unclear if charges were ever filed. A few months after that, he was arrested at the scene of another armed robbery at a McDonald's. It was allegedly the second time he had robbed the place that week. Following his arrest, prosecutors had asked for a high bail to be set due to suspicion that Taylor was a repeat offender. However, he went free after it was set at just $3,500. A further mix-up at the courts after that meant that no one realized that he had actually violated his parole from the 1996 case. By the time police issued a warrant for his arrest, Taylor was already skipping court dates. When he robbed the Wendy's with Craig Godino, he had been a wanted man for months. Within 48 hours of the killings, the manhunt for Taylor and Godino was over. Taylor was arrested first at his sister's home in Brentwood, where investigators found a 38 caliber handgun that was later matched to ballistics evidence from the crime scene, as well as a security footage tape that had been stolen from the restaurant. Following his arrest, Taylor immediately gave up Godino, who was taken into custody at a clothing store in Queens where they had worked together as security guards for a few months. Though both men admitted to their role in the robbery once they were in custody, they told conflicting versions of what had happened that night. Both claimed that the other was responsible for wanting the employees of the restaurant dead, and said that they had been forced to take part in the killing. In an 11-page written statement, Taylor blamed nearly the entire crime on Godino, saying that the murders had happened because Godino didn't want any witnesses. However, this strategy would ultimately backfire for Taylor, as police began to suspect more and more that he was the mastermind behind the robbery and killings. Additionally, it emerged that Godino had been diagnosed with a learning disability as a child and had been assessed as having an IQ of 70. This became significant as there were further pushes for authorities to pursue the death penalty in the case. Ultimately, it was decided that because of Godino's mental assessment, prosecutors could not legally pursue a death sentence against him. He agreed to plead guilty to the five murders and received a sentence of life without parole for his part in the killings. With the death penalty off the table in Godino's case, prosecutors turned their full attention to Taylor, whose capital murder trial began in September of 2002. 
The contentious court proceedings would last until the end of November, during which Taylor and his lawyers would again admit his guilt in the robbery, but claim that he was an unwilling participant in the killings. During the trial, the jury was able to view the chilling security footage from the night of the murders, and heard terrifying first-hand accounts of the crime from Patrick Castro and Jaquan Johnson. Patrick testified that after being led into the walk-in fridge by Godino and Taylor, all of the employees were forced to lie on the ground. At some point, Gina Gust managed to rip part of his duct tape off and appeared to be struggling to breathe, which he said was due to his asthma. According to Patrick, Gene was savagely beaten by the attackers, after which they taped him back up like the rest of them. Then, Godino and Taylor put plastic bags over all of their heads, and he began to hear gunshots. When Patrick next awoke, he was still lying on the floor of the fridge, and could feel a heavy weight on his legs. When he pulled off the bag and duct tape from his face, he realized what he was feeling was the body of his co-worker, Ali Ibadat. Frantically, Patrick asked if everyone was okay, but received no answer. Terrified after hearing noises and assuming that the gunmen were still there, he quickly put the bag back on his head and laid on the floor. When he finally got up again, he noticed that Jaquan was alive as well, though was struggling to move. After crawling around on the floor and carefully peeking around the restaurant basement to make sure the killers had left, he carried his co-worker up the stairs and called the police. Neither Patrick nor Jaquan validated either of Godino or Taylor's conflicting stories that they were unwilling participants in the murders of their co-workers. In subsequent interviews we found with Jaquan, he further rejected this characterization of the crime, saying that there were no disagreements between the two men, and that he and his colleagues were all shot in rapid succession, execution style. He said that he was the last of the seven to be shot. On November 19, 2002, a jury also rejected John Taylor's claim that he was an unwilling participant in the Wendy's massacre, finding him guilty of capital murder, as well as 19 other related murder and attempted murder charges. A week later, he was sentenced to death. Though the decision was celebrated by several of the victims' families, many who believed that death was the only reasonable punishment for Taylor's actions would not be celebrating for long. Following a 2004 court decision that effectively outlawed the death penalty in New York, Taylor appealed his case, and his sentence was commuted to life in prison. He was the last remaining inmate on death row at the time of the decision. At the time of this recording, both Taylor and Godino remain incarcerated in New York, with Taylor at the Clinton Correctional Facility in Danamora, and Godino at the Shongam Correctional Facility in Ulster County. Over the years, Godino has continued to insist that he was manipulated by Taylor into committing the crime. In an interview with the New York news outlet PIX11 just last year, he claimed that he was taken advantage of and that he regrets pleading guilty in the case. More than 20 years later, the site of the Wendy's massacre bears no trace of the chilling events that took place there. The restaurant was closed forever shortly after, and today is home to a mini mall that sells shoes and clothing. However, the haunting crime lives on in the minds of those who remember the five innocent lives that were taken there, far too soon, for far too little. That brings us to the end of our list. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.